Good evening, KubeCon community, and welcome back to Salt Lake City. We are here coming to the conclusion of our second day of coverage, three days here at KubeCon North America. My name's Savannah Peterson, riding this roller coaster of fun with Rob Streche all week. Rob, what a cool show. This, this day has been awesome. I mean, everybody who's been on this day has been just bringing it and experts in what they do, and this segment's going to be no different. Yeah, no, absolutely. We couldn't have a better close to a perfect day. Absolutely. But Michael, thanks for coming to hang out with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, how how has the show floor been for you? It's a, a you know, Dynatrace is a legend around here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so far, very good. So it's it's, I have to say, it's it's my fifth KubeCon, and the quality of the whole event so far. So it it was a great day too, but it was the whole event so far was was awesome and especially here in the US, the best so far that I've been to. It's like, compared to the others, it's like, it has matured so much from the people that you meet, from the conversations that we have, from the organization, like it's, it's awesome. Yeah, I <laughs> love it. I mean, we've it's gotten. It's, I was yeah. going to say we, this is. We feel it, the same. We way. feel the same way in the conversation. The hallway, the hallway track has yeah. been awesome this week, yeah. and I think uh, again, fifty percent, over fifty percent of the people. This is the first KubeCon, so I think there's a lot of renewed energy again every time I get it from the people who are coming in learning but that learning also had a message on day one's keynote which I, I was oh, I agree with them. Starting off with lawyers on stage was not exactly what I expected yep. out of KubeCon, but kept us on our toes. Kept us on our toes. <laughs> but they talked about, in particular, Otel being a target for you know, yeah. as for people patent trolls and things like that, and kind of get into the bounty hunting stuff and how that yeah. works because I think this is really interesting. I love this approach to how people are really helping bring the IP back to the CNCF from yeah. Analytics Foundation. No, definitely. It's, it's, I think, an interesting time for open source and how it's recognized in the industry, right? Um, when we work with our customers or when we talk with, with the community, it's like, I wouldn't say you love it or you hate it, but it's like you have people that are like, really, yes, we, we, need, we need open source. We are, we are ourselves as well, like we're we are very heavily involved in the CNCF. We have several CNCF ambassadors. We have a lot of employees working full-time on CNCF projects, open telemetry, open features, et cetera. So it, it's very important to us, but also to a lot of our customers. And then you have these situations where people probably then think, well, should I really adopt open source if right. I get weird writings and I have to pay stuff? Right? So it's, it was a very interesting start. <laughs> yeah, definitely was. It, was. it was, but it's interesting when I interviewed Priyanka in our in our preview for KubeCon. You know, th there's obviously patent trolls are never fun, and it's not uh, not something you want to have happen. But it is also. Uh, on the other side, it's 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 market validation to a degree. Yep. It's showing the velocity, it, the momentum, exactly. the adoption. Yep. And so it is kind of interesting, and I love the the spirit of you know we'll take them down together, and it and it's very yeah, uh, it's this collaborative. bringing the community together yeah. and like we're here for you and like we together and like. It was very interesting, yeah. Unfortunately, I didn't see too many keynotes. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot I going was, on. Yes. And yeah. so we don't... We so, don't. What, so what have you been seeing? I, again, you've been yeah. very busy, so you, I mean, you get a different perspective than we do because we're kind of tethered to yep. the desk here. I, <laughs> I'm, I was trying to get to the oxygen bar. Yeah. I went. I, I heard. Oh, you, you went. I so went. you're tethered to the desk here. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, went, I went on our 30-minute thir gap yesterday, okay. and it was, it was actually kind of fun. I felt much better I, I tried to go there. But I, I, I haven't been there yet. So no. eventually, hopefully tomorrow is the day that I make it all the way to the back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just to do the oxygen bar as well. But, but it's uh, from, from like the top of mind, the three things that, that I've seen on the floor and in discussions with, with the people here is obviously AI workloads, right? So AI workloads resonating with us as Dynatrace quite heavily as well with the whole AI observability that we do. We work with a lot of strategic partners there and we have some really cool stuff that we can show there. Um, the second part is a lot about observability, of course, but security is back. That was something that I'm very happy to see in, in I, I was not at KubeCon in Paris, but I was in Chicago and Amsterdam, and there, if you looked at the taglines of the different vendors and at the different booths, there was not, there was all AI and automation and observability, but there was not so much 
security anymore and now it's back, which makes me very happy. And that brings me actually to the third point, platform engineering, of course. And I hope or believe that maybe security is back because platform engineering makes it more easier to adopt. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. it's not an afterthought, it's not a different department, it's not something that's like, oh yeah, like the, the problem that we had very often in discussions with DevOps or DevSecOps was that as soon as you talk DevSecOps, it's like the DevOps engineers say, Oh yeah, but like that's a different team. Like it shouldn't be. Right. <laughs> Every right. platform engineering is like baked in. So that that's yeah, really and, cool. and I think that's a good discussion. I, I think especially one of the points and why don't we start here with like AI is everywhere. I mean, the workloads yeah. are everywhere. Observability is a big piece of mm -hmm. this because there's a massive cost when you're yep. doing these models, especially if you're training them and fine tuning them and then deploying for inference. There's a lot that needs to be seen. What are, what are you seeing from the AI is everywhere yeah. part of the conference here? Um, well, yeah, AI is everywhere. <laughs> I. I a lot of interesting discussions about how we see really adoption. Like everyone does AI, right? Like we we have our own Dynatrace Davis AI as well. We had the causal AI, our root cause analysis, um, for the past ten years already. We have predictive AI, we have Gen AI, and we got very interesting questions also from customers and also in the conversations. It's it's good that everyone talks about AI now, but what's the adoption? Like, where do we see the highest adoption? Where do we see the highest value, right? And it's not this um, magic tool that you have and it does all the work for you. The biggest advancements that we've, we've heard is, and that we see ourselves as well, how we adopt AI, Gen AI, is it's a productivity boost, right? And it's, there was a discussion a few weeks back also from, from Google that said like 25% of their code is already generated by AI. But a lot of it is around auto-completing methods, auto-completing certain things, right? So it's really a productivity boost. And this is what we see ourselves as well in the way how we apply Davis Copilot, how customers use it. It's a productivity boost. So it's not this, this magic thing that, that solves everything for you, but it makes you smarter and you more productive. Yeah, and I think observability is one of those spaces where there's just so much data yeah. that AI oh makes gosh, yeah. so much sense. And, and like you said, you've been in, the, you've been doing AI. I mean, AI's, Gen AI is new, but yeah. AI itself is not new. Do you see, like you were saying, do you see the customers coming to you and saying, hey, how do you apply it and how are you using it so that, not just in, from a Davis perspective, but like with the co-pilot, because they're yeah. looking for ideas on how to bring it in, because maybe they're using your hotel, because you have an hotel, uh, you know, collector that basically you've open sourced and you get, you know, people can go and download it and it's not, doesn't have to be used with your stuff, but it's hotel. What, how do you see people like saying, oh, I'm collecting all this data and where do I get started? Or is it more the conversation of, I just want the easy button and yeah. because it's just so much data. Yeah. I mean, the, the, it's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> the, the easy button is pretty much something that we try to have, especially on the ingest side. So we try to make ingest of data into Dynatrace as simple as possible. Otel is one of these things, like we have several employees working on Otel full time, and we have our own Otel collector, which is a curated collector, officially supported by us as well. A lot of different other methods how we can bring in data, but no one brings in data for the sake of bringing in data, right? So where we see the biggest advantage of the easy button of Dynatrace is that we provide answers and opinionated feedback automatically, right? Depending on who you are, depending on personas, we have different entry points that have tailor-made experiences that if you open Dynatrace, a certain application, we already made sense of your data for you. And this is something that helps the most because not everyone is using an observability platform every single day. Not everyone is a subject matter expert in observability, but they still need to understand what they see. And this is where it comes in. And then of course, below that we have for the, for the specialists, we have to drill down our own query language, we have notebooks, et cetera, right? So it's, you can then drill down, but it's very important to make sure that someone who's an occasional user still gets 
the best experience possible by getting these answers. They don't necessarily care about the telemetry that we ingest, right? They just want to know, okay, what, what's the impact on my business? What's the impact on my customer? What's the impact that I have? Like, do I need to do anything? Right. Like the traffic light, right? Well, it's, it, it's about strategy, you know? It's, it, yeah, it, to, to your exact point, a lot of people wanting to know what's going on, particularly with the AI ops within their organization. And to I, you said that so simply, which makes sense and is very on brand, but, but making sense of your data for you and having it right there, that's actually not in a simple task. Yeah. That's an incredibly complex yeah. thing, especially with the different data sources and yeah. silos you're pulling that out of. Yeah. How, how are you, that's got to be a, an, a, an incredible challenge to build that. How are, how are you doing that? How are you making that possible for everybody? Making sense of the data. This is, like I said, this is what we did for 10 years already. So that's the core of what Davis AI was 10 years ago already. Making so sense of data. So you were just data. ready for this moment and waiting for everybody to catch up? Yeah, of course. No. <laughs> <laughs> we were just waiting for the world to be ready. No. Come um, on, guys. <laughs> um, of course, it, it, it grew, right? Mm -hmm. But we've been doing that, and that's the good part. We've been doing it for so long that our customers trust our Davis AI because they know that we have a good root cause analysis. They know that we can pinpoint what the problems really are. And what we do now is we just make Davis more accessible. We make our AI more flexible to be used. So predictive AI, Gen AI has been added, right? Mm -hmm. So they can use it themselves and see what we're actually doing. Like they, they can steer it and understand better. It's not a black box where like something comes in and then just trust the process, right? Um, and on top of that, we have these, these tailor-made experiences. So we, we, we bleed all of that information across our applications. And then, especially our Davis Copilot helps us then, and this is where this productivity comes in, that we bring that in context into the apps as well. So if you're, for example, our Kubernetes monitoring solution, uh, the application that we have there, there are so many different Kubernetes warning events and things that get uh, ingested into Dynatrace, and I don't, no half of them, right? And directly there, you can use Davis Cowpilot and say, oh yeah, can you please explain that? Like, what's the, what is it about? What is normally the root cause that it happens and how can I fix it? And it's all automatic. So you, you click on it, say, explain this to me. And then it comes with all the sources, what they need to do. And this then, with the remediation steps, brings us directly to the automation that we have because we provide answers and we provide automation as well, workflow automation on top of that, right? And that's one of the things that our customers have been asking us for a long time. It's like, you, you tell me exactly with Davis what the problem is, at what point, and what I do have to do, and you still wake up my SREs. Like, why don't you just fix it, <laughs> right? right? So, bringing in automation on top of that was kind of the, the obvious next step. We did that, we created one and a half years ago, and obviously now with Gen AI, it's becoming even more critical to make sure we apply it. So, I, I think one of the things, and you, you mentioned it, security being back, Dynatrace also on the security side, because you're collecting a lot of data and there's a lot of signals in there. Kind of talk to how you've been looking at it from a Kubernetes platform perspective as yeah. well. So, from a security perspective, of course, we have all the, the vulnerability monitoring, et cetera, right? And there's a lot of stuff coming in the future, <laughs> in December, actually. And our biggest advantage, I would say, or our biggest differentiator is that all the data that we have, and it's not just with security, but all the data that we have is like on a unified platform. So it's not different product lines, it's a unified platform. So you can link the data and information of vulnerabilities to our digital experience monitoring. So was there anything happening there? You can look at, at session replays. You can link it with your log information from our log management solution and log analytics, right? So this unified approach really unlocks the option to have much more possibilities to go really deep into the weeds and see how things fit together, all of these unknown unknowns at the tips of your finger, right? So it's, it's really, yeah. No, I mean, and I think, again, you were talking about this up front, but like kind of the third thing that you observed was platform engineering. Yeah. And I think we, we, we've been talking around a lot of the things that platform engineers platform care engineering about. Platform engineering having yeah. a moment right yes, now. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, yes. so what are you seeing? What are you seeing out there from the platform engineering perspective? So, 
I love platform engineering. It's it's very dear to my heart. <laughs> very passionate about that. Um, I, I think with with platform engineering, we have some some advantages and some disadvantages. Um, what we tried for 20 years with DevOps, we talked a lot about DevOps. Also, we as Dynatrace, the whole community, everyone talked a lot about DevOps, mm -hmm. and. We still had customers, or we still have customers that, that reach out to us and say like, how do I get started with DevOps? And it's been 20 years now, right? So, I don't want to say DevOps is dead, because it's not, right. but like this whole culture mindset that DevOps was supposed to be, or is supposed to be, or is, was difficult for people to grasp. And with platform engineering, the advantage and disadvantage is it's very prescriptive. It's like, oh, by the way, you want to get started? Start here. Those are the five steps. And this is good because it allows people to start and really work with platform engineering. Um, the disadvantage is, is that you might be building an internal developer platform that no one wants to use, which is not good, right? So it's, it's right. we need to be careful as a, as a community that we don't make it too prescriptive and make sure like, the most important part for me is, as a platform engineer, your customer is the developer. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you need to have a product mindset. So be data-driven. Talk to your customer. Talk to your developers. What do they need? And then, obviously, we also got the question, why is Dynatrace so interested in platform engineering? If you treat it like a platform, if you treat your IDP like a platform, you need to make it observable because What's your benchmark? What's your bottleneck? Where do you need to improve? Or where do you have the biggest lever to become better, right? And that's, yes, you get that feedback from developers because they know where they have the biggest cognitive uh, load or biggest manual toil, but make it data-driven as well, right? That's a big topic in product management, so make sure you treat your IDP as a, plat as a, as a product and then with those simple steps, I think it's it's easy to really quickly get a good ROI, but also a real value with platform engineering. So it's that's why I really like it. Yeah, no, I think we're big fans of it, and I think again, it's it's one of these things that I think taking that mindset and product mindset is a huge thing because you know, being having been on the product side myself at many companies, you start to look at it and say, here's how we have to. Uh, execute to give that product to organizations. Do you see them getting that, the customers getting that from a platform engineering perspective? Do they understand that a product mindset? Yes, I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> we don't get tired of repeating it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I mean, it's what, what I like is with, with DevOps, since it was more about mindset and culture, or is more about mindset and culture, it's you had these pillars, but you could interpret it anyways. Like, there, there was no wrong way of doing DevOps. Right. Maybe that's a bold statement, but anyways, I, I'll leave it at that. We but like bold. <laughs> we embrace We're here for your passion and your bold statements, for, Michael. Yeah. Don't for, worry. For, for platform <clears throat> engineering, um, it's, it's pretty clear what we want to achieve, right? Like, why do I do platform engineering? And the community agrees why we want to do it, right? So it's, it, it leaves less room for interpretation for the why. You know, like ask five times why, right? If you build a product, why? Why, yeah. And if you know why, ask again why. So it's like, we know why, right? We, we discussed it a long time and we have agreement in a community of a lot of people from a lot of different organizations, different backgrounds, uh, different interests, and we pretty much agree. Again, bold statement, but I think on platform engineering, there's not too much, oh yeah, I see that like 180 degree different than you. Like, we all have a common goal, and everyone, if you go to anyone else here and ask about platform engineering, I do hope they will say as well, like, it's critical to treat it like a product. Like, your customer is the developer. And that is pretty much the, the, the biggest turning point, maybe, in how we apply it. So you have your, your SRE practices and you have your platform engineers, and it goes together perfectly, right? It's like bread and butter. It is like bread and butter. Just like this interview has been, <laughs> bread and butter. I have one final question for you, Michael, because this has been fantastic. When we're hanging out in London at your sixth KubeCon, what do you hope to be able to say then in London that you can't yet say today? Um, well, they can't say it today yet, right? So. Well, it depends <laughs> on if it's secret. It could be an ambition, could be a hope. You no, can smell the beans, we're open. I would like to, currently, what we hear, or what we do with customers, we do a lot of workshops, talk a lot about platform engineering. I would like to be there 
currently we, we help customers to get started. And we have our proof points. We, we adopted platform engineering a while back. We have our own proof points, we have our own metrics, like whatever is the big value. I want to see how non-vendors see it, like people that we work with and how they really apply it. What's the big value there? And of course, there's a lot of fancy stuff coming on the Dynatrace side as well, which I cannot tell yet. But well, we'll, we look, we'll meet in London. Yeah, I really look <laughs> exactly. forward to when we can. That's the spirit, Michael. I love it. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Yes, such a joy. And Rob, what a great day we've had. Thanks for spending it with this me. This has been fantastic. It really has a been. A great way to end the day, one too. Better, one of my favorite days I keep it, on, it was. I, I, I got to say, it's been great. And, I, I mean, it, no and you brought it, and I love it, and this has been fantastic. Quite cherry on top. Thank you so much, Michael. <laughs> thank you very much. I think it's thank awesome. You. And thank all of you for tuning in to our 24 segments over the last two days here at KubeCon North America in Salt Lake City, Utah. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.